Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to the AFI Docs 2021 Industry Forum and to this session, Getting Serious About Series, New Collaborations Between Public Media Series and Indie Filmmakers, possibly our longest title of all the panels in the forum and certainly our, our biggest uh, panel, which we're very excited to have everyone with us today. First, I wanna thank our sponsor of the forum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I also wanna thank our AFI members for their loyalty and support and you, our audience. And finally, I wanna thank our moderator and all of our panelists for participating as well as our interpreters. Please note that if you have questions, please include those in the chat and we will feed those to the moderator for our Q&A at the end. Today's moderator, Leslie Fields Cruz is Executive Director of Black Public Media. She's joined by our panelists who will just go by their first names for now. You'll get uh, fuller introductions from them later. First from the series, we have Julia and Chris from Nova, Cameo from American Experience, Chris Hastings, he gets a last name because we have two Chris's uh, from World Channel and America Reframed, Michael from American Masters, and then our amazing roster of filmmakers, Joe and Michelle, Natalie and Byron, Leola, Yi, and Ben. Uh, and of course, our interpreters, Jill and Shannon. Leslie, thank you so much uh, for moderating and leading our discussion today. You have a tall order balancing all of these incredible people. Please take it away. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Um, as he mentioned, I'm Leslie Fields Cruz. I'm the executive director of Black Public Media. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am streaming to you from the unceded lands of the Lenape and Wappingers peoples. Um, I'm really glad about this conversation that we're going to have today. Many of us who've worked in public media, public media for many, many years, um, you know, we have struggled and we've we've uh, found some difficulties in identifying and having public or diverse voices um, on the national strands. In fact, one of the reasons why we launched the Afropop series is because I had all of this content and I could not find a home for it on any of the strands. So we decided to start our own. Um, but right now we, we're beginning to see a sea change with many of our national strands that are actively engaging with in the independent film community and they're increasing the diversity of the filmmaking pool and they're also engaging in the distribution of the maker's original projects. So I think, you know, the times they are changing, right? Um, so without much ado, I'm going to allow all of my colleagues who are with me today from the makers and the executive producers to introduce themselves because if I were to sit and go through everybody's bio, actually that would be the entire show we'd be done. So <laughs> let me go, I'll go ahead and uh, I'm gonna go based on what I see on my screen uh, and to my right, uh, it's Byron and Natalie. So go ahead and introduce yourself and your film and which strand you're working with. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Byron Hurt, and um, I am currently directing a film uh, for, or in the process of uh, creating a film for Nova called Looking for Grandpa Lee. Um, I have worked within the PBS system for a few different films. Uh, one was Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Uh, after that was Soulful Junkies. Um, and my first film um, was I Am a Man, Black Masculinity in America, all of which, all of those films, were supported by Black Public Media, which was then the National Black Program and Consortium. Um, so that's who I am, and I'll pass it to Natalie. Hey everyone, my name is Natalie Bullock Brown, and I am a producer. I'm working with Byron Hurt on um, a film that we are trying to finish up um, called Hazing, but we are here today to talk about looking for Grandpa Lee, which as Byron noted is something we're working on with Nova. Really happy to be here with all of you. Great, thank you. All right, I'll pass it on to Chris and Julia from Nova. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chris Schmidt, one of the two co-executive producers of Nova. And I think as many of you know, Nova is a weekly one hour science documentary series on PBS. We're approaching our 50th year. And um, Julie and I have been working hard to diversify 
the kinds of stories we're telling, the storytellers, the people in front of the camera. Um, and we're incredibly excited about working with Byron and Natalie, just as he said. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Julia. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia Court. Um, I'm the other co-EP with Chris. Uh, I've been at Nova at a, for a very long time, started as an associate producer and then was a, a producer. And as Chris said, we just took over two years ago as the EPs. And just as, this has been a major focus of ours to diversify a lot about Nova in terms of the topics and the stories who's in front of the camera and who's behind the camera. So we're really, really excited to be here, to be working with Byron and Natalie and to have this opportunity to talk to everyone. Great. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Chris. All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Cameo George, who's with American Experience. Great, hi everyone. I'm Cameo George, I'm the executive of American Experience. As Leslie said, uh, I've been in this position for less than a year. Um, September will be the one year mark. Um, and I am really focused like Chris and Julia, like Michael, like others, like Chris on diversifying our roster of makers. Uh, I think American experience in its 30 plus year history um, has evolved and, and been doing a really good job of, uh, of making sure that there is representation on screen, but I'd like to uh, have that same track record behind the camera as well. Happy to be with you today. Thank you, Cameo. And I'll go ahead and go to Leola, who is working with American Experience. Go ahead, Leola. Hi, um, my name is Leola Kalsley Stewart. I'm with Flow State Films, which is actually based in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, director of Changing State, which is an historical documentary about African American diplomats that worked uh, with the State Department during the civil rights movement in the Cold War period. And I'm working with Cameo at American Experience. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Leola. All right, let me jump to Yi Chen. Yi, introduce yourself. Thanks, Leslie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yi Chen. My pronoun is she and her, and I'm joining you from uh, Napa Valley, the traditional homelands of the Waffle. Um, I'm an independent filmmaker based in Washington, D.C., um, and my film uh, First Vote is a co-production with the World Channel. Um, it aired on America Reframe last year and also screened at AFI Docs. Um, so it's really great to be back, and I uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Yi. All right, I'll go over to Michelle and Joe. Hi, uh, Michelle Stevenson. And Joe Brewster. We're with uh, the Rider Studio, and we are delighted to, to be here. We are... We are working, we're based in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, um, with our company, and we are collaborating with World Channel, Chris Hastings, on a couple of projects, uh, one of which is the Conversations Remix, uh, which is Conversations on Race, um, a derivative of uh, some collaboration we did with the New York Times uh, back in uh, 2015. And uh, we are launching right now a 20 part series called Decolonizing Mental Health with the World Channel. It's rolling out as we speak. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Great, thanks, Michelle, thanks, Joe. And I'll jump over to Chris at World Channel. Chris Hastings. Uh, I'm Chris Hastings, executive producer for World Channel, uh, also executive producer for America Framed. Um, I'm, World Channel is based at WGBH in Boston, where I've been for the past 18 years. Um, and so uh, my scope of my work has always been to try to diversify public media through the work that we do through World Channel. And I'm just excited to be here to have this conversation with makers that I've been working with for a while and to see such a, a rainbow of folks that I've worked with over the years is super exciting. Thanks, Chris. And now let me jump to Ben De Jesus. Please introduce. Sure, hi, my name is uh, Ben De Jesus. I'm a director and producer. Uh, I run NGL Studios with my partner and co-founder, John Leguizamo. Uh, we've done projects uh, with American Masters uh, on Raul Julia, and we've done a project for uh, great performances, and currently we're working on uh, 
Lights, Camera, Acción, which is a, a celebration of Latinos' impact in Hollywood, present, past, and future. So excited to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. And finally, Michael with American Masters, please introduce yourself. Hi, all. I'm Michael Cantor of American Masters, uh, which is produced out of the WNET group in New York for public television. We do eight to 12 uh, films per year, and I just stress that they're done entirely by independent filmmakers. We don't have a sort of staff on board <clears throat> to make films here, and so we're always looking to collaborate with independents, with folks who are allied with um, the Multicultural Alliance that Leslie is a member of, the Black Public Media, along with the other groups. And um, we're just keen to, to work and represent. You know, I think within the PBS world, the question for many of us is, who are we as Americans? And I think the, the broader the scope of filmmakers that can help answer that question, the better. Great. Thank you, Michael, you're absolutely right. And so um, we're going to, now that everybody has introduced themselves and we're gonna jump right into this uh, discussion, it is a large panel. And so I will be asking those of you who are not speaking to turn off your cameras. Um, for, and our first group up will be uh, Cameo and Leola who are here to talk about their collaboration and the work that they're doing. And um, I, I want everyone to know that I know Leola. She was part of Black Public Media's 360 Incubator and participated in our Pitch Black Forum. Um, I know her mentor was Sam Pollard. I was so excited to find out that she got, that Changing State got picked up by American Experience. But I also know that uh, Leola had, it, that, it was, that it was a long, long journey to get there. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, what that journey was like, especially when you're telling a story that is not well-known, not considered sort of a traditional African-American experience story. So I wanna hear from Leola, and then I wanna kind of jump into Cameo to find out what made you want to be part of her project and working with Leola specifically. Thanks, Leslie. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. You know, I began developing Changing State with my producing partners, uh, Kylie Kraskaskis and Michelle Shapiro at Flow State Films about maybe five years ago. And, um, you know, we were lucky, of, to, fortunate enough to get an NEH um, production grant a couple of years into the process. And I think we rather naively thought that we would be able to, you know, raise the balance of the funding in a year and go into production. And it ended up taking, you know, a long time um, to get to this point. And, you know, when you're, you would ask the question about um, whether it was difficult to, um, you know, find, you know, people willing to support a film that isn't necessarily a known topic within, you know, the black experience, um, you know, I would say, you know, sometimes, yes. I mean, I think in the early days of the project's development, you know, a lot of the feedback that we were getting was that it, you know, was an interesting project, but, you know, it was a film that's really taking place during the sort of height of the Cold War and the civil rights movement, but we weren't necessarily telling a film about um, civil rights activists. You know, we were telling a film about diplomats, about um, Black diplomats that were representing the U.S., uh, overseas during that time. And so I, I think that there is sometimes a tendency to kind of view the Black experience as monolithic in one perspective when it's really, you know, diverse and, and layered. So we were um, definitely up against that at times. And I think as the project developed, um, you know, a lot of the feedback that we were getting was that, you know, people were more interested in learning about today's diplomats as opposed to yesterday's diplomats and especially in the last four years sort of unpacking what it means to be black and represent the United States um, under the last administration and so it, the people were kind of pushing us to pull the, the project forward a little bit more which um, you know the original vision for the project was really an historical story and we felt pretty strongly that in order to understand today that you have to kind of unpack the past and that's what we um you know, wanted to explore. So, you know, it was, it, it was a bit of a journey. Yeah. Well, okay. So 
Cameo, you are, as you said, new <laughs> to, to American experience, but I, I know you're not that new to public media, right? And so um, was this program already in the, in the, on the slate or was this a program that you learned about and you were like, no, we're gonna pick this up. And, and, and how, what does that mean? I mean, as, a, as an African-American woman leading uh, a, a national strand, national series, what does that mean for you to be able to green light something like this? Well, I, I like to say that, you know, Leola talks about it being this very long process and, you know, she met a lot of people in the system uh, over the years as she and her partners were developing Changing State, but it fell into my lap maybe a month into my, my taking on American experience and I saw it and I was like, oh, that's a good winner. <laughs> of course I want to do it. Um, and, and I have to say that uh, one of the things that's, that's so amazing about how, how we came together to work on this project is I got an email from Lois Fossen at Independent Lens, the EP there, who was just like, this project came across, uh, across my transom and it maybe is not the exact right fit for us, but I think it's brilliant and I think someone needs to do it. And so that's how it came to me. Chris Hastings also knows Leola and, and her team well. Um, I'm not sure of the exact sequencing, but he reached out and spoke Leola's praises and talked about this project. Uh, both Sylvia Bug and Wendy Yinas at PBS at the Mothership had also had some experience with, with Leola. And so as soon as people heard that I was interested, it was like a collective cheer. There, there are so many people throughout the system who really believed uh, in, in Leola as well as in, in the project. And so, like I said, for me, it was a no brainer because I came in really wanting to focus on the parts of American history that reflects the truest uh, scope of, of America. And so this is a perfect example of American experience, other strands, um, other, other shops have done countless stories on the Cold War, but this was a really unique entry point, a really unique way in. Um, most people are probably not familiar with the three diplomats who Leola is focusing on, um, but we should know who they are because they did so much to change how we think about what it means to represent America, who gets to represent America, um, and what it is that, that America stands for. And so this to me was a, was a perfect example of how I like to think about what we'll be doing more of as we examine and interpret American history. And then just the chance to work with Leola was, um, was really appealing as well because she's got this really fresh voice and this energy, um, and it just felt like yes, let's let's be your home for this. Um, so, like I said, it was an easy yes. Great. Um, that's. I mean, that like I said, I was so excited to find out um, that uh, you all were picking it up, um, and and I would like to say that Chris and Sylvia and Wendy learned about Leola because she was in Pitch Black. <laughs> Well, and I, I do want to I do want to say that too because I think what sort of broke this open for us was really working with Black Public Media and through Black Public Media in the in the incubator program meeting uh, Chrissy Jeans and Wendy Linus and you know then being part of the Firelight program which brought us back mm -hmm. into Chris's orbit who was extremely helpful in helping us navigate the system and um, I think also. For me personally, you know, working with other BIPOC creatives and these mm -hmm. um, BIPOC led organizations that immediately understood, like, this is an mm -hmm. interesting story. This is an interesting piece of history. Like, how, how do we unpack this? How do we, it, it really helped, helped me and, I, you know, us as a team move the project forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, great. Yeah. And I have, so I have one, one last question. And this is actually for you, Cameo, which is, um, you know, you're, you're coming up on that one year mark. What are you looking, what are you, what is your plan for next year in terms of uh, the stories that you're looking for, the stories that you feel need to be um, represented on American experience? Is there anything that you're looking for specifically, and how do you plan to connect with the BIPOC 
makers who are who are developing, possibly developing some of those stories. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, this year has been about just meeting people, seeing who's out there, seeing what stories people are telling. Um, as Leola said, stories that may have languished somewhere else, but um, but immediately spoke speak to me, spoke to me. That is something that I'm that I'm really happy to be able to do as as the head of Amex. Um, I think that next year and hopefully the year after and the year after <laughs> that, you will see a, a wider range of representation of uh, directors and producers on our roster, like period. I think that's really, that's the thing that, that you're going to see. Um, I am really focused on racial diversity, gender diversity, geographic diversity, which we don't really talk about that much, but like, you know, I'm, I'm based in New York. I love New Yorkers. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see people telling stories from other parts of the country as well as part of, of, of a series that's called American Experience. You know, I, I really want us to, to be more reflective. So there are, there's Changing State, which we've talked about. I've got a project uh, for next season in the pipeline that we're working with the Center for Asian American Media. Uh, they helped connect me with the director, the producer, the editor, the writer, who are all from the Asian American community. Um, we have other films that are BIPOC led. And so it's just really, I, I think you're going to see that there is uh, a wider range of voices, but still the kinds of stories that you would expect from a 30 plus year old uh, legacy mm -hmm. series like American Experience. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to watching those stories and making sure that you have some of our makers continuing to access some of the makers that we're working with. So thank you so much, Cameo and Leola, for joining us and sharing with us. If you guys, anybody have questions, please add them in the chat. We'll try to bring them up at the end of my uh, interviews with all of the different groups. All right. Next up, uh, we have Michael Cantor and Ben DeJesus. Um, I think we're going to show a clip first. Uh, from Raul Julia that was on American Masters. That's, that's correct. Okay, let's show that clip. Raul was extraordinarily magnetic. What was also true is that he spoke in his proud Puerto Rican accent. Why brand they us with faith? He was proud of being Puerto Rican. I could bring my own culture, my own Puerto Rican background to Shakespeare. She moves me not or not removes me. The first time I saw him in Shakespeare in the park was just absolutely mesmerized. He was on the poster everywhere, and it was so inspiring to see that everywhere in every train station, every bus ad. I've never seen an actor like Rowe. It was art in front of you. My dad really felt that he could create change in the world and be an activist as an actor and through the roles that he played. It's no longer you or I, it's you and I. He was undeniable. When you have that kind of talent and discipline, success couldn't be avoided. It's all done within a context of love. That's the beauty of it, you see? All right, that's a, I love that film. That was a beautiful film. So thank you, Ben, um, for making it. And thank you, Michael, for broadcasting it. Um, ben, my first question is for you. You are now, what is it, second or third, maybe fourth project working with American Masters? I'm not quite, I'm not sure about the numbers, but I'd love to know how did the partnership start? Um, and what has that meant for you and your ability to continue to create content for public media? Great, well, thank you for having me. And uh, the way the partnership started was, I've actually been a filmmaker with uh, Latino Public Broadcasting on my last, on actually all of my uh, projects for the system for PBS. So we had done a project called Tales from a Ghetto Clown some years back and uh, Donald Toms over at PBS had acquired it. And so it kind of got me into the, into the system, onto the radar of Michael and, and the team over there at American Masters. So I, uh, I had this vision to do a film on Raul Julia and when I secured the rights and, uh, and was able to share that with Michael, he was very nurturing and he was able to kind of take us from a, a little sizzle reel to a, a full on premiere. And it's been a, a wonderful ride so far. So we're excited. That's great. And so tell us a little bit about the project that you're working on right now. Right now, we're actually working on something called Lights, Camera, Acción, which is gonna air alongside the American Masters on, on Rita Moreno. 
And uh, basically it's a film that's really celebrating and highlighting the uh, amazing and incredible impacts that Latino have had on, uh, on Hollywood in the past, the present and the future. And uh, it's gonna air the same night that uh, Rita's doc premieres. Okay, great. Looking forward to that. And so let me pivot a little bit. Michael, I know that um, I met you, I don't know, it's been five, six years at this point. I'm not quite sure. It was at, the, at one of the annual meetings. And, um, you know, I, I felt that your coming on at American Masters, I really felt that there was a change in um, or a growth in the diversity of the voices that were represented in front of the screen. And there was a willingness to really kind of reach out and work with BIPOC uh, makers. Talk to me a little bit about what you, um, what you've experienced and how you've been able to make those changes happen at American Masters and what, what the impact has been for the series working with uh, BIPOC makers to tell BIPOC stories and, and then some. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, yeah, when I joined American Masters seven years ago, um, I looked around and I learned about this entity I mentioned earlier, the Multicultural Alliance that Leslie, for those of you who don't know, is part of Black Public Media. There's, as Ben mentioned, Latino Public Broadcasting. There's CAM, the Center for Asian American Media that Cameo mentioned earlier. Um, there's Vision Makers for Native American filmmakers and PIC, the Pacific Islanders in Communication. And those are just great entities that all independent filmmakers should know about as is ITVS, the Independent Television Service. So those are great entry points when you have a project you're not quite sure where to go to. And for me as an executive producer, those are quickly becoming my best partners. Mm -hmm. You know, those are folks who have the same goals um, as we do um, at American Masters. We're a biography series. And we find, as with all PBS projects, there's never enough money. So by teaming up and finding sort of alliances, allyship, I think is, is, is a good word, um, with these entities, along with entities like the National Endowment of Humanities, we get people to where what they need to do in terms of the budget. So I'm just really proud of those associations that have prompted films on, say, the Native American writer N. Scott Mamaday, where Jeffrey Palmer, who happens to be um, a Kiowa, was telling the story of, of this great Kiowa Pulitzer Prize winning writer. Um, and Ben can speak to, you know, his work. Obviously filmmakers want to tell all kinds of different stories, but it's trying to pair the right filmmaker with the right story that, that often produces something extraordinary. Oh, you're, you're still muted, Leslie. All right. I, I know that you have had a, a specific partnership with Firelight Media on, on the short series. Please talk a little bit about that, uh, that project as well, because um, for those of you that don't know, Firelight Media, uh, they have a lab and they work with a range of BIPOC um, media makers. And so, and I know this project that came about and I was like, wow, this is amazing because it focused not just, it wasn't just the artists, but it was also, um, it wasn't just the makers, but it was also the artists who they were focusing on. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about how that came, how that uh, project came about. Sure. So as you know, convergence happens and more people are watching online as we are now compared to television, it's really important to us and to everybody here, I'm sure to have as big a digital presence and to do uh, things that don't necessarily fit into the hour long length. So we teamed with Firelight Media, um, which is run by Marsha Smith and Stanley Nelson um, to, they have an incubator lab to work with BIPOC filmmakers. And we put out an RFP for a series that looks at what we call in the making, masters in the making. So these are emerging artists and makers who maybe they've done something amazing, but they're not yet at the level of a Raul Julia or a Norman Lear or a Miles Davis, what have you. And uh, the, the RFP for the second season is going to be put out soon. So look for it if this is the kind of film you want to make. But the, the projects, which all ran from seven to 15 minutes, one was accepted to Sundance two won Webby Awards. I'm almost positive that two were nominated for NAACP Awards. So like the rest of our work, it's an opportunity to give independent filmmakers a chance to really tell stories that are important to them and that are, are resonant with today's culture. 
-hmm. Thank you. Um, and Ben, I'm gonna jump back to you because um, I do would love for you to share or discuss. I know that public media, they, there have been some challenges with the audience. A lot of us know that it's an older white audience. With your stories on American Masters, what are some of the ways that you're trying to ensure that your programs are connecting with Latino communities or BIPOC communities in general, especially if they're not necessarily tuning into public, public television, public media? Yeah, well, I mean, we do a lot of work on the social media side to really elevate and promote our projects. So we don't only rely on, you know, the, the on-air promos, because as you mentioned, some of the audiences that we're targeting are not going to be there to see the promos in the first place. So we did a lot of kind of behind the scenes maneuvering. We worked closely with Michael's team and the team over at WNET to really do as much press and promo and social media clips and seeding things that, uh, that maybe wouldn't necessarily go out for a typical program. And I, I just felt like that if we try to grow the audience through, through PBS to people like myself that are not necessarily represented uh, as much as we'd like to, we got to reach them in the places that they are, because obviously if they're not watching PBS already, you're not going to hit them there. So we did a lot of events with the community screenings as well, leading up to the uh, PBS. We were fortunate to have a, a slot at the TCAs, which I appreciate Michael gave us a slot, you know, to really promote in front of all the television critics uh, out of all the films, he chose ours to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it really allowed us to, to speak to an audience that is not the traditional PBS viewer, but also celebrating our culture with the traditional PBS viewer, because the content that, and the stories that I want to tell, they may be themed, you know, Latin and they may have Latino kind of protagonists, but they're really universal stories that are for everyone. So it's not like a project that is only for Latinos about Latinos. It's really for everyone. It just happens to be through this, uh, this lens of, of who I am and, and the kind of stories I want to tell. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we have to move on. I feel like the stuff is going <laughs> rapid fire, but um, we are we we will move on. And again, uh, audience members, please, if you have questions for Michael and Ben, pop them in the chat. We'll try to get to them at the very end of uh, the conversations. If All I right, could have a lesson, yeah. just yeah. just I will say that PBS's commitment and Michael's in particular and the the minority consortium is very real, and I do see the tide is shifting, and I'm excited to be part of that. So I really feel like Michael and the other people here, the executives are really trying to find people out there like myself to tell more of our story. So I appreciate that. Great. Thanks, Ben. I agree. All right. Our next group is uh, Nova with Julia and Chris Schmidt, along with Byron Hurt and Natalie Bullock Brown. Welcome you all to AFI Docs and, and our panel. Um, I'm going to jump. I'm going to, I've been starting with our makers. So I'm going to start with our makers again. I've known Byron for many, many, many years. Uh, Black Public Media has supported, I don't, I don't want to say all, but many of your films. Oh, um, and all of, them. all of them. All right. All yes. Them. All right. Um, and so, you know, I know we, I know your films and I know um, that they are, they explore topics from the African American perspective. How did you, did you ever consider you, con think that you would be making a film for Nova? No, I did not. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> but you know, I'm happy um, to sort of expand and to grow. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, and so when Chris and Julia reached out to me via email and, and said, hey, what are you up to? You know, we saw your previous film, Soulful Junkies and you know, we actually consider that to be a science film, um, which is something that I hadn't necessarily considered myself, but, you know, it sort of made sense once, once they explained it to me. And, um, you know, we started to talk about possibilities, about collaborating and, um, you know, uh, developing a film project that um, would be considered a, a, a science film, but something that I wanted to explore, you know, as a story and as a, as a topic. And so that's how it came came to be. And so, um, you know, here we are and, you know, we've had an opportunity to to work with Julia and Chris. Um, and it's been it's been really cool so far. I mean, they're mad cool people and um, you know, they, they were very open and very receptive to 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 my idea, which um, it just 
it just so happened, you know, that, um, you know, the topic that I was interested in exploring uh, surrounded the, the idea of black family reunions. And um, while, you know, one might not imagine that a, a film about black family reunions would be a science related topic, um, you know, when I really stop to consider what my family is doing for our upcoming reunion, our family reunion, you know, we're, we're using DNA research um, to learn more about our family and family connections. And this is over the counter, you know, DNA research. And, um, you know, when I expressed that that was something that my family was doing, and I also talked about um, the scale of our family reunions and how tricked out they are, you know, every two years and how many people attend and how organized, uh, you know, it was. And, and it just all kind of came together very organically, I would say. Um, and so, you know, this film is going to be sort of an exploration or an excavation, really, of my family's history going all the way back to uh, my paternal great, great grandfather, um, who we know very little about. So we're, we're using DNA research to make connections and hopefully that'll, that'll help us to learn more about our family, potentially going all the way back to Africa, um, but then also putting uh, Black family unions into a much larger social context. Mm -hmm. I think um, I was trying to te uh, text and throw up the picture of Grandpa Lee so everybody can see um, while you're talking about it. I, I wanna ask you though, what is it what is different in how you're telling this story with the either, I mean, you know, I think we all know you know how to make films and you know how to make good films, right? That's that's not the issue. What is different in terms of working um, or, or creating a film that has that science, you know, that science research? Is it is it that much different of, of a different process or is it really just an, in, that introduction to the scientists? What, if you can answer that question, if I phrased it well enough. <laughs> no, no, I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, you know, I think the big difference is, you know, really trying to figure out, you know, what are the right questions to ask? You know, are we asking the right questions? I'm not a scientist and I'm not trying to um, portray myself as a scientist, but I am a filmmaker. I'm very inquisitive and I have questions. And one of the things that you know, Chris has um, expressed is that, you know, a science film is, is anything that, you know, where someone has a question or a series of questions that they ask. And, um, and so, you know, I think one thing that's a little bit different is that, you know, we've been able to team up with um, a biologist and, and a geneticist and Dr. Uh, Fatima Jackson, who uh, Chris and Julia connected us with, and she has been incredible. And I, I'd like for Natalie to talk a little bit about, you know, Dr. Jackson and some of the things that um, she has uh, helped us understand in terms of how big this film could really be, right? I mean, I think that's really one of the great benefits of having um, a relationship with someone like Dr. Jackson is that, um, you know, she, she sees things from a very different perspective, from a science-based perspective and it can help us really fully understand the potential for this film. So you wanna talk about Dr. Jackson just a little bit and just our relationship with her? I, I'll just add that, you know, um, Dr. Jackson has really helped us to see that, that even though this story is specific to Byron and his family, that it's really a universal story. It's a universal story of African-Americans, um, in this country, um, you know, our leg the legacy of slavery, how that impacts um, the way that we engage with and with each other, and also what we know about our history. Um, and so she has really given us a lot of um, information that's inspired us to think bigger and to really um, consider the possibilities of the types of information that we could include in the film that helped to, as Byron said, excavate and sort of um, uncover his family's specific history, but also uncover sort of the African American history, um, you know, as it relates to DNA, to reunions, slavery, and all those connections. All right. 
this is this is exciting. I I'm also I, I have family reunions every couple of years. We were supposed to have one during the pandemic. It didn't happen. Um, so we're probably looking at 2022. Um, but the whole DNA research, my parents have done it. I think it's fascinating. So I'm I'm gonna actually gonna pivot to Julia and Chris to have you share on, from your end when you all saw Byron's film Soul Food Junkies. Like really, what was that? What made the click? And it was like we got to talk to him. And and also, I think so. There might be um, maybe a miss misperception as to the I, the notion that the series they come up with all of the films and then they just hire the makers. In this, you know, you came to Byron and he had a project idea. Was that something that was different for you all, or is that something that you're trying to do more of where working with the independent producers on their original ideas? Yeah, I think, well, we have, Nova has always gotten um, films from a multitude of places and some we develop ourselves and, and then, you know, specifically go out and look for people for the project and some come to us. Um, we do about 20 new hours a year and about half of those are originations that we you know pay for completely and then about half are international co-productions and a handful are acquisitions but for this i think since chris and i took over nova in the past really was more focused on you know certain kinds of science and we have really wanted to expand that and expand the kinds of stories and really explore this relationship between science and society more um, and make because we think science is relevant to all of our lives so we want to tell stories where that is really clear um, so we were reaching out to people and we were reaching out specifically to producers of color you know again to try to convince them that science you know, does relate to the stories that they're trying to tell. So in this case, yes, we we had seen Soul Food Junkies. We'd been looking at people's films. One, we just thought, this is a great storyteller. This, you know, it, this is a person who can capture the human experience and help it, you know, res make it resonate for people. And that's, you know, what we're trying to do. It's just, we're trying to add that extra little lens of science. So we were thrilled and I actually looked it up. It was, Byron, it was actually exactly a year ago today that, oh, we, wow. that we emailed you on, on wow. June 23rd and you answered and we talked to you really fast. And <laughs> I mean, this did kind of unfold very quickly because, and we were, yeah. we were in the midst of doing another show about a, a kind of a bigger picture of consumer DNA testing. And we were exploring all these different ideas about what those tests can and can't do. But, in a little bit more of a survey way. And so when Byron was talking about his family and his experience and, and these questions that they had um, specifically that they wanted to answer, and we saw how science can help answer those questions, but let's, you know, would he be willing to explore that a little bit more in his storytelling? And we were just so excited that he, you know, embraced that and, and ran with it. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, I look at it and I think, <clears throat> um, well, I mean, I have huge, huge respect for independent filmmakers. I mean, my first film was a, you know, 35 millimeter theatrical comedy that I made in the Soviet Union in the 80s as an wow. independent film. <laughs> it's like, that's a whole other crazy story, right? And it was just like a wild ride by the seat of my pants and a bunch of other people. So I completely get how you just get onto these ideas and you and you and you move forward. And when I look at the independent films that we look at, you know, the nonfiction films, there are historical films clearly, and then there are personal experience and observational films. And the funny thing is, is that there's a science film lurking in many of those where people don't see them. So if you're going to do the observational film or the personal film. Um, about family reunions that will resonate with a large audience because they share the experience and you're telling that story. And then you say, you know, oh, my uncle Renard, you know, or my cousin Renard decided to do a DNA test. All we do is we go, whoa, 
hold on, <laughs> let's go down that road. Like, what does that mean? And what does that involve? Or historically, if you say, well, we think we know that my, you know, ancestor came from here and we and ancestor came from there. We're saying, well, there is some science you could do to actually try to answer some of those questions. So we just see this, the, the mix of kind of history and current exploration. And we're, we're just like saying, add this other tool to it. And at the end of the day, we think that that will enrich the same stories. It's not like taking over the story or hijacking the story, but that all of these stories have those potential elements in them. Not all, but you know, many of them mm -hmm. have that, those potential elements and that's what we want to try to capture and explore. Great. Well, thank you, Chris and Julia, Byron and Natalie. I've been given the move on notice, so we're gonna move on, but but we will come back because I do have a question about audience. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that a little bit later. All right, my final group, um, come on up. Uh, Chris Hastings with World Channel and America Reframed, Yi Chen and Michelle and uh, Joe. Uh, is everybody? Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, so Chris, I'm going to start with you. I've known you for a minute too, and, and we've worked with World Channel and have had content on America Refrain. Chris, I want you to share a little bit about World Channel and its role um, and how it's working with BIPOC, uh, in the, BIPOC independent media community. And, um, and then you can, you can connect it either starting with Michelle or with Yi. Um, I'm going to roll with you. Okay, so World Channel within the PBS system is a national multicast channel that is run by WGBH. Um, it's independent from PBS, but it's in partnership with PBS, but it's funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, really with the understanding that our mission within the system is to enhance diverse voices for diverse audiences um, and really Quite frankly, um, going back to the original mission of public media to be about uh, communities that are underrepresented. And so when we think about the work that we're about to talk about um, and the makers who we're talking with today, um, it everything that we've done fits into what I had originally set out to do when I started as EP almost now 10 years ago um, uh, and working with makers who are from the communities and bringing content from their community that is for their community. And so uh, when we think about decolonizing mental health, uh, that was a project that was funded by CPB and PBS to be an enhancement to the mysteries of mental illness, which premiered on PBS last night. Um, working with Joe and Michelle, who I was already working with on another series, The Conversation Remix, um, I had the choice to work with whoever I wanted to on this. I could have did it with my own internal team, but spending time with Joe and Michelle on Conversation Remix, it opened the door for an opportunity for me to work with people who I like to work with, people who gave me an opportunity once, but they also came in with this, this sort of unique perspective on mental health that blew me away that I said, with this little bit of money I have, I'm gonna put it into them to help me do this. And it just sort of, it just sort of made sense. Um, and Yi, uh, who is one of our first co-productions for America Frame, she brought her own film and just needed distribution. And working with her to finish it fit into the mission of World Channel, because as we think about uh, the stories that she was telling through First Vote, it fit into the broader mission of what we wanted to do. We wanted authentic voices telling stories from their community. Great. So. Um... I, what I'm gonna do, I wanna show the clips from Decolonizing Mental Health and First Vote back to back, because I don't want us to leave without it, the audience being able to see those. And then I'm gonna come back and I wanna talk with uh, Michelle, Joe, and, and Yi. So can we see both of those clips? I had just gotten to a point where I was um, functioning with the voices. One night you get five hours, but then the next night you get four, and then find yourself in a hypomanic to manic state. People distanced themselves from me because I didn't understand what was happening. We are seeing disparate experiences based on their race, gender identity, disability. 
in order to provide something to my people, I can't fail. That's not an option for me. Being able to vote is a privilege. Not everybody gets to vote in the world. Asian Americans are the country's fastest growing ethnic group. But until recently, they haven't voted in large numbers. Now, they're finding their voices at the polls. In America's battleground states, how will these voters choose? Make America great again! When I think about how I, I want more Asian Americans to participate in American political life, this is not what I had in mind. This is a democratic process. First vote on America Reframed. Great. Thank you. Great clips. Um, Michelle and Joe, you all have, you're, you're seasoned makers. You've been producing for public media for a number of years. Um, you know, Black public media has been a happy supporter of, of your projects. I, I do want you, this is a co-production with America Reframe, but talk about um, that, you know, the money, the funding, um, <laughs> you know, the challenges and, and what was maybe slightly different with Chris coming in saying, I've got money for this. Uh, and com is it, was it a commission? I mean, what does that mean for you all as independent media makers? So, so we would start by saying uh, thank you for having us uh, and that you know us. Uh, and so we are probably going to take a little different tack. We're going to be thankful, but not that thankful. <laughs> and and uh, Chris started by saying he had uh, very little money. That is true. But what he did have is a relationship. And more importantly, he saw us. Uh, he spoke to what we love to do. And he spoke to our mission. It looked like before he met with us, and it was over a drink at, at, in Philadelphia at um, Black Star, uh, he had read our mission statement. So he knew it would be hard for us to turn this down. Something dealing with uh, issues of equality, uh, uh, dealing with disparity of uh, mental health care. I am a psychiatrist. Michelle is a human rights attorney. so. Let me say it was a difficult uh, experience, but, but it's one that we grew to love. And the product is, is uh, amazing uh, given the budget. It is everything I imagined when I, when I uh, quit my uh, career as a psychiatrist to become a filmmaker, something that could really have an impact on the community that I'm from, something that uh, really this piece looks at disparity from the lens of the of uh, uh, BIPOC community and it said and they say we no longer will stand for this and that we are going to step in the gap mm -hmm. uh, so that money is very interesting uh, we we uh, firmly believe that Chris doesn't get enough money because uh, uh, his station stands for everything we stand for mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and I've seen the budgets and I know what it exists, but I think if we, this would be a better world if uh, Chris would have his way. <laughs> <laughs> the World Channel had the support um, mm -hmm. that, that it actually deserves in the system, whether it's WGBH or the larger public media uh, station and really putting sort of the words in the mouths of the mission of uh, diverse voices and representation. I think just to add just a couple of things in terms of what I've been hearing and thinking about the mission of uh, World Channel and understanding where we are right now in this historical moment, I want to first recognize that we may not even have been in this panel if it weren't for George Floyd and his murder. And the uprisings that took place this year. Things have changed. Not so much what we do has changed, but how what we do is perceived has changed, how it is seen has changed. So I just wanna recognize that it's because of violence and blood that has been shed, that we have this window of opportunity for how long I don't know, because our democracy is literally at stake 
uh, right now in this moment around voting rights and more and around the stories that we tell and critiques of critical race theory and all of the above. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is critical. We are warriors in this battle. And, and Chris is at the, at the forefront of this warrior battle that we are part of in this battle of narratives. So I really wanna take that moment to recognize that in the same way that we recognize uh, the indigenous lands that we are on, that uh, there are many George Floyds behind us that open these opportunities. Can we push it more uh, so that we really do create long-term uh, uh, change. And let me finish, please. <laughs> One more thing I want to say, I've heard a lot about universality. Um, I'm not about universality. Uh, uh, I think it is a bit of a trope when we speak about that. And I think it's uh, Ralph Ellison who spoke about it. it is in the specificity. My story is just as specific as the story of, of, of a white middle class community is very specific also. It is in how we tell our stories. It is this common humanity that we uh, uh, share. And for me, it is very intentional that our audience be us, right? Mm -hmm. Our audience mm -hmm. is us. And it is time that that be broadened and that the intentionality, the money, the story, the objectives uh, uh, take the space that they are entitled to. And so with that, this collaboration has been wonderful with World Channel. It's been a labor of love. Yes, the money has been tight, but we've been in that situation before. We make a way out of no way, as our ancestors have and as we continue to do. And I look forward to bigger budgets, <laughs> bigger stories, but also creativity. But I, I would like to add that we, we learn from no money. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. like we're, we're making a, a film about a well-known African-American poet, Nikki Giovanni. And, uh, uh, trolling for uh, archival footage for very little has really benefited us in so many other ways. And so I can point to a myriad of, of uh, examples where these disadvantages have now become advantages for our career. But we're going to just mm -hmm. leave by saying uh, that, uh, that things are changing, but not fast enough. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. We want to be a part of uh, making a way for other filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, to have these opportunities to be seen as first options and not uh, third or fourth, or fourth. Or, mm -hmm. uh, an option when a crisis comes along. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Michelle and Joe. Thank you for keeping it real because it is, it is about that. Um, I'm going to now go to Yi, and I'd love for you to talk about First Vote. I know I noticed that it had support from my colleagues at the Center for Asian American Media, um, Ford Foundation, ITVS. I mean, you had all, all, all the, the, the funders there, and yet Chris still had to come in and, and help at the back end uh, to, to support the film and then around distribution. Talk a little bit about what that meant for you for First Vote to get that film, to get the additional support and to get it out there into the world and what what Chris was able to do for, for your film. Uh, yeah, so um, like you said, Leslie, uh, First Vote got early production funding from um, Center for Asian American Media and um, ITVS in 2018. Um, so in, I met Chris in uh, 2019 um, at uh, Hot Dogs. Um, so I actually pitched the project um, to him. I was, um, it was in post-production. I had um, a work sample. So I pitched the project to Chris um, and he was um, very interested in it. At the time I was looking for um, distribution uh, for, the, for the film. So, um, uh, and it's my first, um, feature length uh, documentaries. Mm. So um, it's, it's, you know, it, I think the film really, I'm really grateful for the support I've, I've got from public media um, uh, funders and also um, distributors like World Channel. Um, it could be, you know, it's challenging for first time filmmaker um, or actually for a filmmaker working on first feature length. So, um, so yeah, so after that uh, we, kept in touch and um 
and uh, Chris and Kim actually ended up being um, uh, co-production for the for the film. Um, so with that, um, Wo Chana was able to not just um, broadcast the film, but also provide support around uh, marketing and around um, impact as well. Um, and so, um, and also, uh, so they're actually, because the film um, broadcast aired uh, in October before the November election. So in September, uh, World Channel and Cam, they actually organized a uh, public screening and, um, and a panel discussion with Asian American um, organizations um, to have a conversation around um, voter engagement. Um, and that's something that uh, was really important to me making this film is um, to uh, have an impact um, in mobilizing Asian American voters leading up to the November election last year. Um, and I would say the other thing, um, the co-production with World Channel is that they're also able to find um, uh, distribution um, outside broadcasts. Um, so working with um, Chris also uh, was able to offer a distribution with PBSD, um, PBS distribution and um, bring the film to uh, PBS documentaries, um, Amazon, uh, Prime Video Channel. Um, so that, um, and they released the film uh, earlier this year um, and also on iTunes. So that just increased the um, the access that the public, quote unquote, uh, those that have the subscriptions on those channels can actually uh, connect with your film. So that's that's fantastic. Um, thank you, Yi and Chris, Michelle and Joe. Um, I'm gonna call everybody back on. We're actually, we have about six, five, ten more minutes or so uh, left on this panel. I'm not sure if, if anyone had any questions. Please uh, place your questions in the chat. Um, but I actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back around to something that Michelle um, said, which is, and I and I agree with her. I've had questions. People have always asked me, well, what's going on? Do you you know in this moment? Um, what do you think? What do you think? And I actually respond by saying, you need to ask me that question in two or three more years. I mm -hmm. said, because history has shown me that whenever there's a crisis, there's this like, we got to do something right now. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, we're kind of like, wait, what just happened? How come nobody's calling me? How come no one is knocking on our door to create? My question for my executive producers because my makers, the makers, we're always, they're, they're gonna be making films. The stories are gonna be out there. So my question for my executive producers are, how do we make sure that this moment is not a moment, that it continues, that it expands, that the doors, that we keep the door open and wide open and, and invite everyone to the table so that all of our perspectives can be considered as stories and shared to the public. Um, Y'all? Can I say ahead. something real quick? Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I think one of the problems of the system is actually going to come to our rescue, which is that once something gets going in the system, it's very hard to change it. It's a slow moving boat, the trajectory, you know, things do not change quickly, which has been a problem for access. But once, if we can get a bit more, like two, three years, like you're saying, we get a bit more traction we get a bit more momentum. It's just gonna become the norm. And I think that that is gonna do a, a huge amount to prevent any kind of like kind of retrenchment. Um, and that the people who are in the system are gonna be established in the system and it won't take long. And then they're gonna be bringing in new people into the system. And I just feel like the whole thing is going to take on a, a different kind of momentum. That's my personal take. Anyone else? I think we need to build capacity in the system to make this sure this work is sustainable. Um, as somebody has been here probably far too long, I've watched things come and go based on who the administration is. Um, I think some of us have survived and some of us continue to keep the door open. 
But I think one of the things that has to change is we have to change. We need to add more capacity for this work. And, you know, like I'm so glad to see Cameo across me at WGBH and being another EP. For the longest time, I was only EP of color on the national level. And so to be able to know that I have somebody else of color who is a gatekeeper, who is, is who sort of can understand those stories that need to be within the system, that's important. That's a good step forward. But as we continue to sort of look through how does this sustain in the next two to three years, we need more Cameo Browns. Um, I'm sorry, Cameo George. We need more, we need, we need more um, opportunity uh, to make it more equitable. I see that I see there's a question from the audience, but I just wanted to yes. say I think I just want to give a shout out to two really important people within the PBS system. One is very recently Sylvia Bug, who's worked at both CPB and PBS over time, is now the the national programmer. And I think her interests and impact will be felt over the next few years. And also also Catherine Washington, who's long been at CPB. Uh, as part of um, what used to be called DNI, diversity and innovation, uh, they're really strong supporters who control a lot of money. And I just hope that, in particular, my my lobbying has been that they give more money to the Multicultural Alliance because that, to my mind, that's a great way to to uh, seed new filmmaking and to to make sure diversity happens. Well, I'm all for that. <laughs> Um, so let me go. We do have one question that came through and it's uh, from Michael Grayson and Tasha Edinburgh. What is the best way to pitch a completed project or a docu-series? They say specifically to World Channel or Black Public Media, but I will, I will ask for all of my uh, EPs to answer that question because I think there might be others who want to pitch stories to you. So um, Cameo, what's the best way for them to pitch a completed uh, project or docu-series to you? Well, I, I have to say we're we're not fully equipped yet to to take fully completed series. Uh, we we rarely we rarely do series at American Experience. It doesn't mean that that we won't in, in the future. Um, but right now we really are more in the mode of wanting to be co-producers and editorial partners. So for us, it, it actually is better to to Come, come to me and have a discussion way earlier in, in the process. I know that's different than, than some of the other strands. Um, you know, we spoke a lot about, about Leola's project and, you know, while she and her team had been steadily working on developing it for years, uh, when, when we came into it, there was still a lot of work to be done. And so since we've commenced, there's been shooting, scripting, and you know, no editing had taken place. So we really are in the position of working with, like directly with Leola and her team um, mm -hmm. to, to shape the film. It is her idea, it is her baby, um, but we we get to to help her birth it. And so um, so I, I think we're for, for us, it's the earlier the better. Okay. Great. Um, we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to jump to Nova and then American Masters and then to World Channel. How do they how do they get to you? How do the makers get to you with their stories? Oh, Julia. Julia. Yeah, yeah, they can they can email us. Um, we also have a submissions portal. We look at everything that goes into the submissions portal. Um, I think, as we said before, we look at projects at all stages of development, whether it's just an idea, whether it's in production, whether it's an international co-production or a, or finished films. Um, so we're, we're interested in all. It is true that most of our film, the vast majority are either ones that we shepherd all the way from the beginning or ones that we co-produce and collaborate on um, you know, internationally. But we do do a few, we have, and we've been doing a few feature docs in the last we've started we, that's been a new thing for us we've been doing 90 minute feature docs um and we've had two so far we've been really really excited about those i wanted to Thank also you. mention this on the question about the future mm -hmm. that we're also really focused on this on building multiple on-ramps um mm -hmm. at multiple levels 
and really looking both to work with really, you know, experienced filmmakers, but also early career um, creators as well. And we're, we were creating opportunities to do, you know, to package, say, three shorts in a broadcast hour. So we're going to be putting out an open call for those soon. But we're really we're we're interested in in working with people who maybe haven't done a feature before, and just creating more opportunities in the digital space as well. Great, thank you, Michael. Yeah, I think um, for completed films, you know, I would just caution people. You know, PBS has different. We're stuck with certain formats and running times, so it's always better to hit us up with a rough cut or a fine cut because something might be finished and it just might not fit and it, it becomes tougher. But uh, you can, in addition to pitching individual series, there's people at PBS, someone mentioned Wendy Yenis and Bill Margol and Bill Gardner, people who are assigned to different kind of groups. So if it's a standalone series, such as what I used to do before I, I joined American uh, Masters, then you can, you can connect with them. Uh, in terms of our pitching process, you know, hit us up any which way. You can find me on LinkedIn. We, I saw the WGBH portal. I think it's a great idea, and I'm going to propose that to WNET just because it seems so accessible. But, um, you know, we joke. We have an open floor plan, and I, I like to joke, if I had a door, it would be open. So <laughs> bring it on. Thank you, Michael. Chris? Um, for finished projects, you can submit it directly to me at worldchannel.org slash submit. Um, but most important, like you talked about uh, festivals. I'm at a lot of these festivals. I'm in these streets, so come talk to me. Um, and quite frankly, Leslie, the NMCA, there are the uh, you, Black Public Media, CAM, Vision Maker Media, Pacific Islands and Communication, um, uh, LPB, my pro most of my projects that I'm looking at first are coming from the NMCA because mm -hmm. we were developed to be a partnership of those organizations. And so if you're not talking to them, then you're not necessarily talking to me. I want to know what everybody else is looking at. And that's really the best pipeline to World Channel. Right. Thank you. Um, and actually for, I, I think Chris said it, if you are looking to, if you're looking for Black Public Media, you can go to our website um, and we can actually look at completed films for our Afropop series, but also if you have a project in development, you need to submit it. We are, uh, our open call will be coming around this year. Uh, I think the portal will be open by July. So you can apply to, uh, for our open call. And then of course, my colleagues at the National Multicultural Alliance, Vision Maker Media, Pacific Islanders in Communication, Latino Public Broadcasting, and the Center for Asian American Media. Um, I think I gave a link for you all to go to the NMCAA's website. Um, and then that way you can find the information and link to all of us. So um, I think that's it. We are done. Uh, we're a little over time, but we started a little late. So I think I'm all right. I want to thank all of my guests. I shouldn't say my guests, but all of AFI's guests uh, today for this incredible panel. And um, you know, those of you who are thinking of working with public media, uh, BIPOC community, BIPOC makers, please, please work with public media. We are here and our voices need to be heard and we need to be seen. So thank you. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to throw it to you and that's it. Thank you so much, Leslie. And thank you all for what I think is one of the, the best panels on public media and documentary film that I've heard in a long, long time. Um, and um, to our audience, the, you know, things are changing and will continue to change because of all of the people you see here assembled in this gallery. So thank you to our great panelists and moderator. Um, just a heads up about later this afternoon, uh, please join us for Looking to the Future with Hindsight, which is happening at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's another great collaboration happening in public media. Um, we'd also love to hear from you on social media at hashtag AFI docs. Um, and another event happening tonight is a meet the programmers welcome event at 7 p.m. Eastern. See the festival hub at docs.afi.com for more information about that. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you.